Today, we're moving forward in this series in the book of Nehemiah. It's an Old Testament book, and um, you could find it in, in your Bible. But we uh, are going to begin with a question before we get into that. The question is, what is the scariest thing or one of the scariest things that you've ever had to do? scariest thing you've ever had to do. And maybe you're, you know, this will take a while. Your mind may be going to situations where you literally were in physical danger. There was a threat to your life. Uh, maybe it was a situation where you felt way out of your league or you were unprepared or unqualified. Um, I ran across, you know, it's not new uh, information, but, you know, they, they do that survey where the greatest phobias people have, the fear of public speaking is right there at the top. Actually, I noticed two higher than the fear of drowning. Um, so maybe for you, somebody asked you to talk in front of a group of people. Uh, maybe there was someone in your life that was opposing you or threatening you, and there was just a very real fear of being around uh, that person. Whatever that is for you, you know, I, my kids, I taught them to do backflips on our trampoline this summer. And it was super fun, and they're really, really good at it. They make it look really natural. But I have a confession to make. I've never done a backflip and I'm terrified of it. Uh, I'll teach you. I'll be the guy who like does this with your legs. That sounds fun, doesn't it? Uh, but I'm terrified of landing on my, on my head. I'm very afraid of the idea of a backflip. But we are, as I said in this series of Nehemiah, called Rise Up and Rebuild. And today in our series, Nehemiah is very afraid. He is, he is terrified. Last week in chapter one, we saw that he was really devastated by the news of, of the destruction of his, his homeland, his city, and it says he was weeping and mourning, and that sadness certainly carries over into chapter 2, but it quickly transforms into fear, and we're going to see this morning why. But uh, the book of Nehemiah is this real-life story of um, a man who, despite all the obstacles, even his own insecurities, his fear, uh, stepped out in what God had called him to do, to rebuild Jerusalem and and restore God's people to their city. Um, I love the Bible because over and over you see these are not superheroes. These are not people with special powers. They're just normal people like us, but people who saw the opportunity God had put in front of them and stepped out in obedience, and God did amazing things through their obedience. Uh, so if you turn in your Bibles, Nehemiah 2, as I've mentioned a couple times, we were going to read the first 16 verses of this chapter today in three different chunks. And I really, again, would encourage you to follow along however you can do that. If you want to do it on your phone, uh, the Bible's in front of you. If you turn to page 398, you'll end up at Nehemiah. Um, so just encourage you to follow along. And as everyone is turning there, maybe you were not with us last week for the sort of kickoff of the series, I want to catch you up. Nehemiah is in the role of cupbearer to the king. And he's living in a kingdom where he was literally born into exile. It's not the city of his, of his fathers and his grandfathers. He's born as an exile along uh, living with thousands of other Jews who had been carried off um, when their city was attacked and destroyed years earlier. And one day, Nehemiah sees one of his brother coming up to him, and his brother had been back in Jerusalem. And he says to his brother, he asks his brother, how's it going back in Jerusalem? How's the city? How are the people? And the brother's like, not good. Not good. The city is destroyed. The walls are, are destroyed. The gates are burned by fire, and the people are in shame and trouble. And what we did last week, we talked about how Nehemiah responded to this news, which many times we hear bad news and we're kind of like, oh, you know, bummer for them, but I've got somewhere to be, you know. But Nehemiah allowed himself to be affected. He allowed himself to feel the reality of the brokenness that he had just heard described, but he doesn't just sit there in his feelings. He asked God for help, and we focused on Four qualities last week of his prayer. If you read that prayer, you'll see these sort of ingredients, if you will. The first is he affirms God's greatness. God, you are not responsible for what's happened. You are holy. You are good. You are right. And then he acknowledges his own sin. He's like, God, you're not to blame. It's, it's us. In fact, it's me. I am responsible for what has happened. He then goes on to appeal to God's promises. God will always do what he wants according to his promises. And so you see through the Bible these, uh, these people of faith who are saying, God, you said this. You said this, and I'm holding you to that. 
And then finally, Nehemiah commits to acting accordingly, acts accordingly. And that last point is where we pick up today in chapter two. What does it look like for Nehemiah, not just to run off in some general sense and get busy with the needs, but to really ask himself, what should I do according to the opportunity God has given to me? And that's where chapter one ends with this statement where he says, now I was cupbearer to the king. He gets it. He goes, this is my avenue for influence. And so we pick up now in chapter uh, 2, verse 1, and let's pray before we read. Lord, we thank you so much that you have something to say to us today, to every one of us, and I know that that's going to be different for every one of us, Lord, uh, that there are maybe general things that, that we will all hear today, but we know, Jesus, that you are alive, you are the living word, you are here with us, you are with these folks in their home by your spirit, and you are going to speak today. Lord, we uh, pray that you would tune our hearts, tune our ears to hear, to listen, most importantly, Lord, to act accordingly as you lead us. We pray this, Jesus, in your name for your glory. Amen. So Nehemiah 2, and let's just start with the first three verses to kick it off. It says, in the month of Nisan, how many of you drive a Nissan? Okay, <laughs> it's not the same thing. But anyway, um, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I, this is Nehemiah, took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So we're just going to pause here and there to sort of make some observations as we track through this story. But I want us to notice, first of all, the time that's passed between chapter 1 and chapter 2, because we get a time stamp in, in chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 2, verse 1, where he, he talks about the month of Nisan, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. What this amounts to, as I mentioned last week, is four years, uh, four, four years, Woo. four months, excuse me, four months have passed since Nehemiah first heard the news about Jerusalem and how bad it was, four months has passed uh, between then and this moment. And we talked about how Nehemiah used this time almost certainly to interact with God, to wait on God, to listen. But it really occurred to me this week that Nehemiah also had a job, right? He, he, I don't imagine for a second that Nehemiah retreated to his room for four months and just prayed. Who has the luxury to do that? Anybody? We have lives, right? And so Nehemiah spent multiple hours, probably a day, with the king. For four months, he's with the king. And, and one thing that, that uh, crossed my mind is, why didn't he bring it up sooner? He's with the king. And, and then, as I even began to ask that question, I realized as I was reading, does Nehemiah bring it up at all? He doesn't. Nehemiah doesn't ever bring it up. He just can't hold the burden in anymore. The king sees that he's sad, and he's like, why are you sad? You're not sick. Something deeper is going on. Anybody ever have the feeling of carrying around a burden that you, something you know you need to do, some, someone you know you need to talk to, but you don't know how? <laughs> you don't know what to say. You don't know how to crack the ice on that. Anyone feel that? You're not alone in that. But what I want us to see here is a man, not only who's committed to prayer to learn what God wants him to do, but a man who is committed to waiting on God for the when. Four months he is serving as cupbearer to king, carrying around this burden in his heart and just going along with, with his job and waiting and waiting. And, you know, um, I think that's the hardest part, if we're honest, is, is once we learn, okay, there's a need waiting on the Lord for the opportunity. When, God, how, how do you want me to act? And so I could almost see Nehemiah being like, Lord, either take this burden away from me or give me an opportunity to do something. So that's what he gets here is an opportunity, by the way. He says, uh, I had not been sad in the king's presence, but then the king notices and says, why is your face sad? 
Now, this is the moment when Nehemiah now has an opportunity to share what is on his heart, what he's been carrying around for four months, and you would think that he would be thrilled. The king's like, why are you sad? You know, it, it almost reminds me of like as Christians, it's like, I'll share the gospel if somebody will come up and say, would you please give me the gospel? You know, or like they come up, they're like, why do you have so much hope and joy? And, and those moments as Christians, you're like, oh, oh, yeah, this is it. Let's sit down. Let's do this thing, right? And you think Nehemiah would be like, finally, I get an opportunity to tell him what is on my heart. But look at what it says. Then I was very much afraid. I was very much afraid. And one of the questions that I want to explore this morning is, is why? Why was he afraid? This was a question, by the way, that came up at our Monday morning time down in the chapel. And just as an aside, I announced last week, every Monday of this series, we're going to meet in the chapel 12 to 1, and we're just going to look at the scriptures for the coming Sunday. We're going to read it. We're going to make some observations on our own and then just discuss it. And I expected a few people to roll into my office, and there were about 27. So... We went down to the chapel, and I want to tell you that because everyone is invited. Anyone's invited. We're going to have some, like, snacks, trail mix, granola bar, stuff like that, drinks every week. If you can only make one of them, that's fine. Uh, but every week, we're going to be reading the verses for the next Sunday to sort of invite you into the process of preparing and listening for God. Um, but this, incidentally, was one of the questions that came up. Why is he so scared? Now, it is important to note that there were literally laws in the kingdom prohibiting sadness in the king's presence. Uh, and, and the reason is, if you're around the king, the king is the most amazing person in the world, obviously. And so if you're with the king, you're happy. Uh, if this is a solar system, who's the sun? The king. Everyone revolves around him. Everyone reflects his expectations. And so simply put, if you were sad in the king's presence, you were a poor reflection on the king. We also know at this time that it was, and this is from the book of Esther, which we'll hear a tiny bit about later, it was illegal to talk to the king unless he first spoke to you. So there was also probably a little of that going on, like I just need to wait for him to bring it up. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about some fear that could have been associated with his role as the cupbearer to the king. We may hear cupbearer and picture some lowly servant, you know, bringing up a little cup for him. The cupbearer was a highly respected, well-paid, influential officer in the kingdom. Uh, the cupbearer was also highly trusted by the king because he would not only select the food and the drink that the king would eat and drink, but would often sample it in order to make sure that it was not poisoned. So he's literally like a bodyguard for the king. And so because of that, cupbearers had to be people of character on some level. They had to be loyal because all you had to do if you wanted to get to the king is get to the cupbearer. You just had to convince the cupbearer to poison the food or the drink, and that was the end of it. So these had to be well-trusted, reliable people of character. They also, because of their proximity to the king, were people of influence. Multiple hours a day, they would have conversations. Many times, kings would entrust information to them, would confide in them, would even seek out their perspective. They had influence. And one of my favorite examples of this in the Bible because it's funny, we get into these series and I learn he's a cupbearer and I'm like, oh, cupbearer. And then I'm like, oh, and I'm remembering all the other places where I read about cupbearers but never even noticed. Uh, like Genesis chapter 40 is the story of Joseph. Joseph is sitting in prison next to two of the king's officials who were thrown there, the chief baker and the chief cupbearer. And they're there in prison and Joseph approaches the cupbearer and says, remember me when it is well with you. In other words, when you get out of prison, remember me and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of here. So he says this to the cupbearer. He recognizes in this culture, in this kingdom, there's influence with the cupbearer. Now we know that this cupbearer forgot. <laughs> He forgot about Joseph. He got out and he's like, sweet, I'm back in my job. And he forgot. But then later in the next chapter, it says he remembered that king's chief cupbearer spoke up, which as we know, leads to Joseph being brought out of prison. He interprets Pharaoh's dream. He's set free from prison and eventually set as ruler over the entire land. 
So these were men of, of influence in the kingdom. But back to Nehemiah now, because of this close relationship and his role to intercept threats, uh, quite simply, a sad face on a cupbearer was a bad sign. Does that make sense? Right? If the cupbearer is bringing food and wine to the king and he's like, mm, you know, the king's not going to eat and drink. Um, and so that was probably a reality here, which is probably why Nehemiah says he'd never been sad in his presence. Because his whole demeanor has to reflect, it's all good, right? No threats. Eat up. Enjoy yourselves. I love you. You're awesome. Thank you. Uh, and then I think it's also why right after it says he was terrified, the first thing out of his mouth is, let the king live forever, right? And this was, as you may know from even the book of Daniel, this is a common expression. People say it. Uh, but I think there was special significance for Nehemiah. You're, it's all good. You're going to live forever. There, there's, there's no problem. There's no threat here. Whatever the cause of fear, if nothing else, it could have just simply been, this is the moment. Four months, four months, he's been doing his job. He's been faithfully coming. He's been carrying this burden. And then the king goes, what's up? And I'd be scared. I'd be like, oh. And so, Let's continue. Verse 4, listen to what the king says. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? Which, by the way, is like a miracle. It says probably a lot about the relationship these guys had that he didn't say, off with your head. Uh, what are you requesting? Nehemiah, what do you need? And Nehemiah, it says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I'm asking that you'd send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. So here's the ask. I want to I get sent home so I can rebuild the city of my father's graves. But what strikes me about this moment is Nehemiah has had four months to pray. He's had four months to plan, to think about how he could approach this and what he could ask the king. And then the king comes to him after four months of preparation and says, what are you requesting? And Nehemiah says, oh, hold on a sec. I just need to pray. And first of all, I don't even know what that would look like if just in his spirit he just stood there and it says, because he said, then I prayed to the God of heaven. You know, does he close his eyes? He's just standing there. And, and as I'm thinking about this, I'm like, don't you know what you want by now? Has God not already spoken to you? What are you, what are you praying about? An obvious answer that just jumps off the page all through the book of Nehemiah is that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He was a man of prayer. And what I mean by that is prayer was not a box that he checked because the Jews were required to say prayers. Prayer, uh, d prayer was a, a language of relationship that permeated every part of his decision-making process. Not just, Lord, help me today, and then he's on with his day, but as he's walking into a conversation, Lord, would you give me words? Huh. And in our case today, as money appears suddenly in his bank account, um, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Right, you, you see it all through the book. It's part of the language of relationship. And this is not just Nehemiah. It's throughout the Bible. And listen closely. God never presents himself as this person who's wanting us to do all of these good things to add up so that he will be then happy with us. That's not the picture that you see in the Bible, even though that's often how Christianity is presented. What you see is a God who wants to walk with you. He wants you to walk with him as you would walk with any person in your life. Keep in step with him. Listen to him. Have fun together, right? And you see this right in the first chapter of, uh, the, rather, the first book of the Bible in Genesis. It says that Enoch walked with God. You go a little further and you find Noah. And it says Noah walked with God. Abraham, also in the book of Genesis, says, walked with God. It's this theme over and over. The people who please God pleased God because they walked with God. And then when you fast forward to the New Testament, Paul elaborates in New Testament language when he says, keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, walk with God. Walk with God. Keep in step with the Spirit. Um, one of my favorite pictures of this is Micah chapter 6. I think what I like about it is there's this real raw human picture of God's people throwing a fit. They really are. They're like, what do you want from us, God? You, you, want, you want a bunch of burnt offerings? Is that what you're going to be happy with? Do you want us to sacrifice a thousand rams? Is that it? Ten thousand? Uh, do you want a bunch of rivers of oil, God? Or, or do we need to sacrifice our firstborn? By the way, this is how human religion works. 
I, I went on a mission. I pray three times a day. I face a certain direction. I give 10%. I stay. I try to make it to church every single week. And you're trying to stack up all of these good works to convince God that you're a good person. And that's where they're at in this religious mindset. God, what do you want? What do you require of us? And God answers the question. In verse 8 of Micah 6, he says, this is what I require. It's what I've always wanted for you to do justly, to love mercy, and what? Walk humbly with your God. I want you to walk with me. I want you to walk with me. That's all I want. That's all I've ever required. And as wonderful as this sounds, it's really hard. Can you relate? I think it's hard personally. I'm just speaking for myself because I want to be in control. I want to set the direction. I want to set the pace. I like to be in control. And when you're walking with someone, you're looking at them. You're listening to them. You're slowing down when they slow down. You're speeding up when they speed up. If they change course, you change course. That's what walking means. And I just wanted to illustrate this, but in order to do that, I need a volunteer who's willing to walk up to this stage. Okay, right here. Thank you. Oh, good. The first service, it took a while. And I was like, well, we just can skip that. Um, remind me of your name. Kelly. Kelly? Kelly, thank you. Can we hear it for Kelly? Okay. Okay. Oh, my goodness. You are brave. And there's a guitar pick. I'm just going to set that right there, Draylen, wherever you are. Uh, Kelly, thank you for coming up. Um, now, very simple request. I want you to just lead me back to your seat. Okay? So easy. So easy. Now, okay, you're good. Well, actually, I realize this is a little more comfortable for me. No, come on. Come to, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. This feels weird. I don't normally do this. Fine. Yeah. Oh, okay. So right up here. No, slow down. No? Okay. Okay, here we go. No? Down. no? Let's sit right here. Right here, okay. Here, Thank you. Scoot over for me. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Oh, now I'm in trouble. I have to cut out. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> that was good. Oh, man. Whew, you learn a bunch of stuff when there's other people involved. It's fun. Um, thank you so much. That popped into my mind this week as I thought about the way I often am with God. I either say, no, God, you can lead me wherever you want right here. Or... Okay, God, we're going here, and I got it. Good, we're good. We're good to go. And so back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah's like, okay, God, you want the wall? Right on. I got this. Woo. But you see in Nehemiah active, ongoing dependence. Responding, listening, God, I know this is the burden you've given me. I, have a, I, I think I know what you want, but I really want to make sure that this is what you want right now. So it says he, he stopped and he prayed and, and he listened. And, and I'm sharing all this because um, I think of like biblical principles, and I don't want to come across wrong that I'm criticizing biblical principles. There's a lot of really good biblical principles that, that we can live by, but you can live according to biblical principles without knowing the God of the Bible. You can just order your life according to these principles. And, and the reality, though, is that the Christian life is not about following principles, but about following the person of God. That's why Jesus said, follow me. He doesn't say follow the, follow the rules of, of, of the religious traditions. Go to, go to the temple. Hey, why aren't you guys at the temple? You shouldn't be fishing. Get to the temple. He just said, walk, walk with me. Do what I do. Follow me. And the reality is, and here's the point I want to make, when principles replace the person, prayer becomes unnecessary. When principles replace the person of God in my life, I'm no longer walking with God, I'm following a set rule, or I have a general sense about the direction we're going and I take off. I don't need to pray because I know what I'm doing. But this is not easy because my comfort zone is control. I want to stay where I know what's going on. I want to set the pace. But if we want to follow Jesus, here's the point. We are going to be led out of our comfort zones. It's going to prep you, okay? And by the way, that is right where Nehemiah is at, way out of his comfort zone. Not only is he in danger of losing his head, right? He's, 
He's scared. He's very afraid. He had not been sad in the king's presence before. But he's also asking to go rebuild the temple. Now that we know of, there's no construction experience in his recent past. He's a cupbearer to the king. So I'm going to go rebuild the city is way out of his comfort zone. There's no qualifications that would suggest that this was a good idea for him to do. And, and, and then on top of it, again, he had most likely never been to Jerusalem. He didn't even know what he was getting himself into. I want to go home and rebuild, and I, and I don't even know what I'm, I'm getting into. But he gets permission, verse 6, if you're still with me. Let's continue. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me, uh, given me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fo fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. So he has, a, he has a plan here that he's asking for. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Now, it would be easy to read this and interpret it to mean that Nehemiah came up with a wonderful plan, and then God blessed his plan. And that's often, I think, how we can interpret it in sort of the, 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 the ambitious, utilitarian society we live in is pull up your bootstraps and do it. And then, by, oh, by the way, at the end of your plan, say, God, would you bless this and the good hand of God? But really what is taking place here is exactly the opposite of that. Nehemiah had aligned himself with God's plan and therefore the good hand of God was upon him. And you're going to see that, that he took the time to allow God's heart, God's purposes to soak into his own heart so that the wills were aligned. And then as he moved out, God's like, I'm with you. You see, I think that's a significant uh, difference there. But so he, he goes out and, and, and the king is very generous in his response. Notice he's He's like, yes, you can go, and yes, you can have letters, and yes, you can have all the materials that you need, which is actually surprising to me a little bit because this was the same king who had previously banned the rebuilding efforts. You can read about that in Ezra chapter 4. They wrote letters, and the king said, okay, stop it. No, you, this is a, a kingdom that normally rises up and becomes big and stops paying taxes, so Stop. Same king who's now saying, go and bless you, right? And I just wanted to highlight a little moment, a little parenthetical notation, and the queen was, was there. And the queen was sitting beside him. As I'm reading through this narrative, I'm like, uh, so what? Um, but you may or may not know, 30 years or so earlier, there was another Jewish person, a woman by the name of Esther. Esther was made queen by this king's father, Xerxes or Ahasuerus, if you read the book of Esther, that's the name. But Esther is made queen, but then shortly after the events of Esther, about 10 years later, Xerxes, who had made Esther his queen, was assassinated, was assassinated by the commander of his bodyguard. And so that left Esther and Artaxerxes, Xerxes' son, to step up to the throne. And so, I, I, you know, we don't know 100%, but I don't think it's an accident that he said, and the queen was there. The same woman who years earlier had risked her life to save the Jews in the Persian kingdom is now sitting there listening to a request to intercede for the Jews outside the Persian kingdom. You fill in the blanks. But the king grants his request. In verse 9, we continue, Nehemiah sets off on this journey says, then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. I'm not going to drill into this opposition this morning because it just gets worse and worse and worse. And so in a few weeks, we're going to spend more time on the experience of resistance in our life. 
experience of opposition, but I simply want to highlight that this is the first recorded time that he experiences opposition. And I want you to notice that it didn't happen uh, back when he was thinking about what to do. It didn't happen when he was even praying about what to do. It didn't happen when he was planning. It didn't happen even when he goes before the king. It didn't happen. He got blessed, right? But as soon as he steps out to do what God has called him to do, he is met with resistance. Can you relate? Now, this should make all kinds of practical sense, knowing our enemy and his opposition to the redemptive work of God in this world. And I really believe that I don't think he cares so much if people go to church. I don't think he minds. I don't think he minds if they even have you know, holy impulses rise up in them to do great things for God as long as they don't act. As long as they just sit with the feeling and go, oh, that was a good morning, and go back to life as usual, they're not a threat. But as soon as we step out, even little intentions, little actions are better than big dreams. As soon as we step out and say, I'm going to do something, I don't know what it is, I don't know what it'll produce, that's when Satan goes, you're a threat. Again, More about that in a few weeks. But I do want to put a picture up here of this journey that we just read about. And you can see over there on on the right, uh, he's in Susa. And it says right away that he came to the governors beyond the river. And you can see from this map, this is the Euphrates River that he crossed. And then he sort of hugged the southern boundary of the empire there on his journey. Now, this is a a journey that would take, uh, would be about eight to nine hundred miles. So you just think about that. This journey on horseback, and, and uh, in our Monday study group, Bob Reed was there, Cowboy Bob. Yeah, there he is. Uh, he pointed out in this group, as somebody who knows horses, this would have been a month or more of a journey on horseback to take this trip, is what he was doing here. And, uh, and so he's, he's, he's making this trip. He arrives in Jerusalem, though, and the first thing he does, so what does he ask permission to go home and do? Build, right? Rebuild, rebuild the walls, rebuild the city. So he gets back and he starts building, right? Wrong. Look at verse 11, and this is the last section we'll read this morning, 11 to 16. Look at what he does when he gets home. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Okay, notice he took a month to get there and he spent three days. That's a bad model for a vacation if you're into that, okay? Maybe flip-flop it. Um, but he's, he's there for three days, and it says, Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. And there, again, is that picture. This was not Nehemiah's idea. He was waiting on the Lord for this. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode, and I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, for there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. So we're stopping right before he lets the people in on what God has put in his heart to do. And he gives them responsibility. That's next week. But what I want us to focus here is that Nehemiah takes time, three days, to inspect the damage. He doesn't come home and just start stacking blocks and saying, all right, let's go, everybody. Let's get this thing going. He takes three days secretly to go around and get a a holistic, comprehensive sense of how bad it was. And I think it would have been a, a lot easier to just maybe not spend that much time focusing on the damage because, again, I don't think he's ever been here. This is the first time he's seen the city of his fathers, and it probably was not an easy three days for him. 
to picture how that gate got burned and what happened here and all of the different homes that had been destroyed as people were killed. Um, but again, I'm, I'm very visual, so I wanted to give us a picture, really quickly sequence of what we just read. So here's the outline of, of the walls in Nehemiah's day, the city. And it says he started in, in the valley gate, at the valley gate, the bottom left there. And then it says in the text that he walks uh, to the dung gate on his way. And there's some spring there that we don't even know is still there, but there's like apparently was a well or something. Um, and then, uh, by the way, the dung gate, in case some of you are thinking, they would literally take refuse and garbage out through this gate and put it in a place where the winds would carry the smell away. So there's a reason for the name. Uh, but then he moves on to the fountain gate, followed by, he says, the king's pool. But he says, but the animal couldn't go with me. So apparently he maybe went in and took a quick look and then he went back out and got back on his animal because then it says he, in verse 15, goes up the valley, Kidron Valley. So along the way, he says, I'm inspecting, I'm inspecting, I'm looking at the wall. And then he turns back and enters by the valley gate back where he started. The whole way though, what I want to focus on for this morning is that he was inspecting the damage. He was inspecting the destruction that took place. And this word inspect was used almost, uh, almost exclusively in this culture, in this language, for a doctor who would, who would probe at a wound, <laughs> at a messy wound, who would, who would inspect, who would pull the tissue apart. And the whole purpose of it was to get a sense for how bad it was so that the doctor knew what to do in order to make it right. Does that make sense? So that's a picture of what Nehemiah is doing here. It's like, I don't even know where to start until I know how bad it is. He's going and he's inspecting it. And I think we could agree that without this work, the walls would never have been rebuilt. And I want you to let that sink in. Without these three days of facing the wreckage and looking at how bad it had gotten, there would have been no rebuilding. Now, I think about this as it relates to my life, and I don't know if it parallels at all for you, but how many times do we concentrate only on what makes us feel good, only on what's, what's happy, only on what's working, but we ignore many times what's wrong, and, and, um, or we're oblivious to it, we don't even know because we've never taken the time and devoted the time like we see Nehemiah doing here. But if we're willing to begin inspecting, that is the first step on the process to rebuilding. Does that make sense? To rebuilding, we have to understand, okay, what's the damage? What caused this damage? What's needed in order to put this wall back together? That's when we begin to move into the phase of healing and restoration. But the point is we have to make room for this just like Nehemiah does. And that's not a really popular idea in our culture to examine our lives and to go, what is wrong here? This is essentially, by the way, what Haggai, the prophet, says to the, the, the group, the first group that was allowed to return. Remember when King Cyrus came and he said, all, all of the Jews, if you want to go rebuild, go home. God stirred up this pagan king's heart to send the Jews back. And the first group that went back started rebuilding. They, they built an altar, they laid the foundation of the temple, and then they stopped. But they only stopped working on God's house. It says that they kept building their own homes. And they had wonderfully paneled homes with all of the latest updates and renovations. And they were living great. The problem is they had forgotten God's purposes in the city. They weren't even aware of it. But, but Nehem, uh, Haggai rather comes to them and he says this. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. Just think. Think about your life. You have planted much, and listen to this, this comparison. You're, you're expecting a certain outcome and you're not getting it. You've planted much but harvested little. What do you think's going on? You eat but are not satisfied. You drink but are still thirsty. You put on clothes but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. In other words, you're doing everything you should be doing. You have everything at your fingertips, but you're still not fulfilled. Does that ring any bells? You have access to more than any generation before you has had anywhere close to, and somehow you're still not happy. Consider your ways. Think about your life. Verse 9, he continues, you hoped for a rich harvest, but they were poor. 
Did you notice when you brought that harvest in? Did you do the math and say, what's going on? This is God speaking. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. See, however you want to apply this to your life, I can certainly apply it to mine. The point is they had mixed up their priorities. God was no longer number one in their life. It was their stuff. It was their homes. It was the remodel. It was the addition. And there's nothing wrong with that stuff. But God's like, hey, you are ignoring me. And if you look at your life and if you're honestly considering what's going on, you're going to say, life is not what I want it to be. Right? Look at that. So we ask, is life what you want it to be? Is your marriage what you want it to be? Is your experience of joy what you want it to be? Peace. The question is, if the answer would be no, no, then why not? See, that's what God is doing here. He's probing at the wound, which hurts. We would all admit that's an important part, but never fun. He's probing, he's inspecting not to hurt his people, not to shame them, certainly, but to rebuild them to restore the harvest that they long for, to fill them up with the food that they're eating. So at the end of the day, they say, God, thank you for another day. Everything is right. He is inviting them to revisit the wreckage, to be honest about their lack of joy, to be honest about their lack of fulfillment with the things of the world. But I want to just say that the only way we can do this, by the way, raise your hand if this sounds fun. I mean, it's not normal for us to do this, which is why I don't think we do this, but the only way we actually could do this and say, I'm going to take this seriously, I'm going to have my little metaphorical three days like Nehemiah, is if we know that we have a God who offers hope, that we know we have a God who doesn't leave us staring at the wreckage and point and laugh, look what you did with your life. We have a God who is rebuilding what's broken, who doesn't just restore our temporary mess, but who did what was needed to bring eternal redemption. Amen? That is who our God is. And an example of this, a God who keeps his promises, and this is the last thing we're going to talk about this morning, is right here in Nehemiah 2, there's this incredibly significant moment related to the promise of a Messiah, of a deliverer who is coming, not just to rebuild the city, but to restore his people to himself. Um, There are over 300 Old Testament scriptures in the Bible, prophecies that are all fulfilled in one person, Jesus. And I don't know if you know that, but one of these prophecies, there are so many about how he would die, specific details, where he would be born um, in this little unlikely town of Bethlehem. But one of these is in Zechariah 9, verse 9, 500 years before Jesus was born, he said this, behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, if that sounds familiar, it could be because all four New Testament Gospels record the event where Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And the people said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Zechariah tells us how he would come in, but Nehemiah indicates when. And here's why I want you to follow me, because there was another Jewish exile living in the Persian kingdom around this time by the name of Daniel. Daniel was carried off in the very first group of exiles. Back, we talked about it last week when Nebuchadnezzar attacked and took King Jehoiakim, the first of those. Daniel was in that group. Nebuchadnezzar literally cherry-picked the like healthiest, best, most talented people of the Jews. Daniel was in the group. And so he's living in this Persian kingdom and he's praying one day and he's confessing his own sins, very much like Nehemiah, and he's asking God to deliver his people. And while he's praying, the angel Gabriel comes to him and says this, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, sound familiar? Until the coming of Messiah the Prince, There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Now, I want to really quickly say a few words about this. Weeks, you may be like, wait, what? In this language, weeks was a reference to groups of seven years. Okay? So when he says seven weeks, he means seven groups of seven years. So seven weeks would be 49 years. 
okay? And this is not, I'm not making this up, I promise. It's not some like fringy end times thing going on. This is, this is the Bible. This is what God chose to include for our edification and our good, right? So Gabriel comes prophesying two events. The city will be rebuilt and there's coming a Messiah. And I love this because what he's doing is he's addressing their immediate uh, wreckage, you know, th- their need for rebuilding of the city, their, their short-term restoration, but he's also talking about their eternal redemption. Yes, the city is going to be rebuilt, but you know what? I'm actually going to rebuild you and restore you to God through the Messiah. If you want to think about it another way, it was their immediate physical exile, and then he's like, and also your spiritual exile, your separation from the God who made you. I'm going to deal with that. But what he says is from the moment there's a command to rebuild Jerusalem, God himself here through Gabriel is giving the beginning of a countdown. And what he says is seven and 62 weeks. Now, if you add that up, seven and 62 is 69 weeks is groups of seven years, which is 483 years. It's been in a comfort zone. I'm out of my comfort zone, but we're going to keep going, okay? Now, we know that Nehemiah 2 took place in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Xerxes, literally a time stamp in history, 445 BC. We know that from history. And Nisan, by the way, is March 14th. So we can actually say that the beginning of that month, we know the day. Now, here's something else. The last thing, the Babylonian calendar year at that time, again, you can read this in history, was 360 days, not 365 days. So Daniel hears this, he's interpreting this. And if you multiply 483 years by a 360 day year, you end up with 173,880 days. Now you're like, so what, right? Uh, What are we going to have for lunch? No, stay with me. I'm almost done. Jesus began his earthly ministry, we are told by Luke, in chapter 3, verse 1, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Again, a time stamp. And we can actually tell, since we can find out the exact date of Passover for each year, which is also the month of Nisan, Passover is, when Jesus was crucified, Several different Bible scholars have shown that from the command to rebuild Jerusalem, counting forward 173,880 days, lands you, many have shown, on the exact day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt. Which you could say, and I would definitely argue, was the only place where Jesus could have reasonably been said to be presented as Messiah the Prince. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, maybe this interests you, maybe it doesn't, but we are talking about this because God talks about it. God includes such scrupulous details in his word. Over a third of the Bible is prophecy, and so he intends for us to have at least some level of understanding, or at least try, right? But what this understanding establishes and where I want to leave us is that we have a God who always keeps his promises. And you can see this in so many different scriptures where God is the one that we can trust with our wreckage. He is going to follow through on his promise of redemption, amen? He cares enough to even probe the wound, even when it hurts, because he wants us to be healthy and he wants us to be restored. Friends, I was reading an article this week on how many Jews, the percentage of Jews who converted to Christianity who can tie their conversion experience back to this, what we just talked about, Nehemiah 2 and Daniel chapter 9, where they're waiting for the Messiah. They're still waiting, they're waiting, and then they read this and go, Jesus is my Messiah. The prophecy continues, by the way, to say that this Messiah would be cut off for us, not just would appear and be received as Messiah the Prince, but that he would shortly after be cut off for us. You can read this in Daniel chapter 9. God is so serious about restoring our brokenness and rebuilding our lives that he killed his own son for our sins. He put his own son on the cross so that we could find forgiveness and restoration and redemption so he could give back to us what's been lost and build up what's been broken down. Is that good news? This prophecy goes on to say that Jesus, the one who rode into Jerusalem, who was rejected for us, who was crucified, quote, to put an end to sin and atone for iniquity, he goes on to say that the same Messiah will come back to bring everlasting righteousness. He is our hope. That is what we're waiting for. In the words of Hebrews chapter 9, Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. 
Friends, God always keeps his promises. He cares about your brokenness. And he is coming back for his people. Uh, Would you pray with me? And our worship team can come. Even as we bow and just close our eyes, I I, I want... um, A lot of this really comes back to awareness of what's going on. That somehow Nehemiah could have seen the city and said, that's just too hard. I'm not going to deal with that. And he turns around and goes back and says, never mind. But he spent the time and he walked through around the walls. He examined the damage because he wanted more than anything to have the city be rebuilt. And I want to just encourage you, whatever is coming to your heart that is broken, that has been destroyed, maybe by no doing of your own, I want to encourage you to stay there with God. Stay there. Allow time to realize what's wrong so that you can say, Lord, my marriage is not what I want it to be. But I know what I want, and I know you want more for me, God, but I can't move forward unless you help me understand what's wrong. Stay with him in that place. As hard as it is, knowing he is good and he is going to lead you through that place to redemption and restoration. Use this final song to interact with him. Jesus, we we do want to hear from you. We want to be changed by you. Lord, we do not want to simply learn or to have some positive feelings and then just go back to our lives. God, we want to be led in what it means to act accordingly for each one of us based on where we're at, based on what you're calling us to do. God, give us the courage to revisit the wreckage in order to allow you to begin rebuilding our lives. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you. Amen.